Good morning, everybody. Everybody doing good? It's nice, uh, warm uh, summer afternoon, or uh, morning, excuse me. It feels like afternoon already. It's, nice, it's warm. Uh, it's hard for me to use the word nice because we don't like hot, we like cold. But uh, I know some people like to warm. Anyway, uh, anyway, enough of that. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, good morning. Hopefully, everyone's doing good this morning. Just a couple announcements to get started. First of all, uh, our Elios Discipleship Program is resuming uh, September 4th, and that's actually not this week, but the following week. So uh, uh, that'll be on a Wednesday and Thursday evening. Starting uh, worship starts at 6:30, and in about uh, the classes, we'll do two classes each night at 7 o'clock, and they'll be they'll be here. And so. Uh, if more information about that, if you're watching online or whatnot, uh, you can go to our website at whitehousediscipleship.org and go to the section Bible Classes, and it will give you our schedule, it will give you our classes, and all the information. It's free. Uh, our goal, as we've been talking about even in our recent study on the essence of the matru uh, spiritual maturity, our, our heart is that we would be all we would continue steadfastly in the apostles' teachings. That we would, in other words, we would, we would be steadfast in the Word of God. And we would be equipped and disciple. That's my heart as a pastor. That's the heart of this church. That's why we call ourselves the Lighthouse Discipleship Center. Uh, we want to do other things, obviously. But at the same point in time, at the foundation, at its core, we want to be discipled. And uh, I encourage everyone... Uh, whether you go to Karis Bible College or you come here, or but just take a season and just get into good teaching, good discipleship. And uh, if, if you're going to another church, that's fine. We're not trying to get people to come here necessarily. Uh, not that we don't want to grow. That's that's another topic. But just uh, we want to be a, a a resource. We want to be a blessing, and we want to uh, encourage you with a good, sound teaching that will help equip you and disciple you. Uh, and well you up in him and all things. And that, okay, we we'll good. So that will start uh, September 4th, a uh, week from this coming week. Uh, we got the next, we am saying that right? But September 4th and 5th, that's a Wednesday and Thursday night, and uh, they're free. So uh, feel free to come, if you can come at any time. Uh, follow our website, classes change uh, pretty much every four weeks or so. Sometimes shorter, sometimes longer. Uh, but just uh, follow our website, and we'll be keeping you posted by Facebook, uh, by, by, uh, some of the classes and whatnot, and anyway, okay? So I haven't said a lot about all summer long, but now we're getting to the threshold of starting up again. Another thing I want to invite you to, if you are here locally, uh, Saturday, September 21st. Uh, so again, that's a Saturday, September 21st, between 12 and 5 p.m., uh, we're going to have a special seminar right here. We have a couple other churches that are going to be joining us uh, that are local. Um, but anyway, um, Peter and Donna Falsgraf, they are mission they are missionaries in uh, Kenya. And uh, they will be here in uh, the States. They'll be here. Uh, and we're going to let them minister to us. Uh, um, Peter's going to be ministering to us on Discover, on Discover Your Identity. He's going to be talking uh, that afternoon. We'll have some uh, uh, light uh, foods for you to, to snack on during that seminar uh, between 12 and 5 p.m. Uh, and so we just encourage you to, if you can, to come out. It's free. And just get some good good grub uh, as far as the Word of God. And uh, let's fellowship together. And uh, you'll really love Peter and Donna Paul's craft as they come and minister to us. That's Saturday the 21st. Again, all of our, uh, our events and information is on our website. So, okay? So that's coming up here uh, next month. So, uh, that being said, you know, we do have Bible study tonight at 6, uh, six o'clock. Uh, and then we just started last week. We're opening our house at 530 for those who want to come and worship for about a half hour or so before we get to our Bible study. So Bible study is still the same time, 6 o'clock. It's growing. Feel free to come if you haven't been here already. Uh, but if you want to come even earlier, uh, feel free to just come worship with us at 530 and uh, before we get to our study. So God bless you, and then uh, let's go ahead and get into our study this morning. We good? 
Okay, so we are talking about the, the essence of spiritual maturity. I think we're in our fifth week um, the, 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 this morning. Uh, going a little slower than I thought I would with this, but that, that's okay. Um, and or we, uh, anyway, let's just go ahead and jump into our study. Go with me, if you will, uh, to turn to Acts chapter 2. It's kind of our main text for this, uh, this series that we're talking about. But in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to pick up verse 40. And then we just get turned there on my iPad here. Acts chapter 2, verse 40. Okay. And the scene is Pentecost. And Peter's been, uh, the 120 that were assembled in one accord have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Peter is preaching, and we pick it up right there in verse 40. And with many other words did he, Peter, testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And I'm in the King James. And they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 42. And they, these men, so now there's 3,000 people have been added to the 120, so these, they, there's 3,120 people who have received Christ, the first born again believers of the church, of the church's birth, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayers. Uh, there's four things that the early church, the first 3,120 believers, born-again believers, that ever existed in the church of the church's birth, these 3,120 believers continued in four things. The apostles' doctrine, which we've been talking about, about the last couple weeks, the fellowship, which we're going to finish up today, and then uh, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Uh, will be the following weeks, okay? The early church, we were continuing steadfastly in four areas. So we've been calling this kind of our, uh, uh, Dwayne Sheriff calls it the spiritual growth track, and that, uh, I'm okay with that term. Uh, uh, our, uh, and we've also talked about a path, a path of life. And one thing that we're trying to instill is that if, if it was good enough for them in the early church, it's good enough for us. That if we will continue steadfastly in these four areas and be well balanced in these four areas, it's one path, it's one track, but there's four aspects of this track. If we will continue steadfastly in them, we will grow. We will grow, we will mature, and actually, the maturity is just a byproduct. Uh, I hope I'm making sense with that. But it's just, uh, you know, and we start with the Apostles' Doctrine. We start with getting, getting them the Word of God, but more specifically, the Apostles' Doctrine, the New Testament. And we want to be well-grounded in sound doctrine. And sound doctrine is just a fancy word for teaching. We want to have a basic teaching. We want to have a, a basic principle, foundation um, um, of what we believe. We need to understand what the Word of God says, specifically the Apostles' Doctrine, but regarding fellowship, regarding breaking of bread, and prayers, and in every other category that we could talk about. But we need to be grounded in the Word of God. Everything starts with teaching. Everything does. Everything starts with knowledge. And we need to be taught steadfastly, continually, the Word of God. Okay? And it will affect us in ways that are supernatural. We're going to get into some other things along this line, especially when we get into next week, we'll talk about the breaking of bread, which more specifically, we're going to be talking about covenant. Covenant with God and covenant with, with each other. And we'll get into that starting next week. But we need to have a regular diet of feeding on the Word of God. We need to have our own relationship with God and His Word, yes. But we also need a, a, a time, a, a systematic uh, a system in the sense where we're, we're being taught from the apostles' doctrine. We're being taught by the fivefold ministries from apostles, prophets, um, evangelists, or missionaries, 
pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, to the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. So we won't be like children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but as play and craftiness of man. But um, and we would grow up in him in all things, and that we would be, as God has knitted us together as a family of God, we would edify one another in love. But we need to start with the apostles' teaching. We need to, we need to start with, with uh, uh, the, uh, being grounded in the word of God. And la la starting last week and continuing this week, we we're talking also about fellowship. Because the early church continued steadfastly, not just in the apostles' doctrine or teachings, but they, they continue steadfastly in fellowship. I can read you a hundred scriptures from the New Testament, from Jesus and Paul, uh, John, James, and Peter, about how we need to love one another and how we need a fellowship with one another. The New Testament, if you study it, it's loaded with how we need a fellowship. We need a fellowship with God for a month. Uh, uh, mostly, but we also need a fellowship as a body of Christ. We are not an island to ourselves. It is not healthy to be isolated. There, it, ultimately, yes, it's our walk with God, but not only do we need one another, but other people need us. And I believe there's a synergy, there's an energy, we are effective together. We are effective when the body of Christ is unified. And we need to have a regular diet, not just of the Word of God, but we need to have a regular diet of fellowship. I don't think all, everything needs to be about fellowship, but we need to have regular fellowship. It's healthy. It's good. It's unhealthy when that is not done. Fellowship, we studied last week, is the word koinonia. And this word koinonia, we brought out four aspects of that and just by definition. First of all, it's partnership. We're partnering with one another, okay? Uh, we're, again, we're not an island to ourselves. We are sharing the gift of life with one another. Your story needs to be told. My story needs to be told. We're sharing together in the gift of life as the body of Christ, as the family of God. Thirdly, the koinonia also means social intimacy. We're, our Intimacy on a social level as a body of Christ, as a family of God, is at a deeper level spiritually because of our common ground in Christ, but is at a deeper level and it's different than the world's idea of just hanging out in fellowship. Okay? The world understands hanging out. The world understands uh, they, have, they, they have their clothes they have their bars or whatnot. But, so they understand the need for fellowship, in that, in, at least in that context. Uh, but us in Christ, we take it to a deeper level. Does that make sense? And, and so, I mean, most shows that I, I've ever watched or movies, they want to just, let's go get a drink at the bar. That's not us. We, we don't want to go drink. I want to hang out with people. I'll go take someone to coffee. I don't like coffee, but I want the fellowship. Okay? And, um, and that's just one example. Hope, I'm just trying to make a point. But God created us for fellowship. God created us for need to hang out. But as a body of Christ, we need to have a, something in our diet on a regular, continual, steadfast basis uh, where we have good, wholesome fellowship. And we need to balance these four things that the early church did. But one of those elements needs to be a regular diet of fellowship. Okay? Uh, the fourth area is distribution. And it kind of goes with some of the other definitions, but we are giving away something. It's, you know, fellowship is not just so you receive fellowship. Fellowship is a partnership where you also give fellowship. It's a two-way road. And it's not just, I don't want people to just come here because uh, of what I can give you. I want to give you, I want to minister to you. But you come and minister to us. To fellowship. And, uh, and it, the, the more the merrier. And it, it blesses us. Uh, we, we're not blessed when we don't see you, but we're blessed when we do see you. We don't want to mandate that. We don't want to give people a hard time. We're not here to manipulate something. We're not here to be selfish about it. But it's healthy when the church 
on a regular basis is fellowshipping together. Am I making sense? Okay? I'm just getting warmed up over here a little bit. Um, with that in mind, let's go, uh, go back to 1 John chapter 1. We were here last week. I'm not going to read the whole context again. I'm going to pick it up in verse 7. And as I get there, I'm going to toggle to the New King James. So just bear with me. I'm almost there. For 1 John chapter 1, we're going to pick it up in verse 7. I'm not going to read again the whole context here. But uh, uh, let me just, uh, again, pick it up. I'm going to actually pick it up in verse 6. And John says, If we say that we have fellowship with him, God, and walk in darkness, and we lie, do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he, God, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Not just some sin, but from all sin. Okay? There's a lot here. I'm not going to necessarily reteach everything I taught last week in this context. But if you read the whole context of verses 1 through 7, you'll see that fellowship with God is important, but also fellowship with one another is important. When we sin, when we walk in darkness, we damage not only our fellowship with God, but we, we, we damage our fellowship with one another. We don't damage our fellowship with God in the sense that God stops fellowship with us. God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. Even in your worst, even when you were, yes, sinners, Christ died for you. God will, even the church in its worst condition in Revelation, we talked about this a few weeks ago, even in its worst condition, Jesus is standing at the door to knock that he might come in fellowship. God won't stop fellowshipping with you because you're in sin, but you will stop fellowshipping with God. You will stop fellowshipping and you will break your fellowship with one another. Does that make sense? It's important that we see that. That's what happened in the garden. When Adam sinned, God never stopped fellowshipping with Adam. Adam stopped fellowshipping with God. Okay? And so, when I walk in darkness, see, when, even at times when I mess up, and at times when I'm not doing what I should do, and maybe I go down a path that I shouldn't go into my mind, or maybe I have a bad day, a bad attitude, or I don't respond to something right. We've all had times when, we, when we've done a, just to quote Dwayne Sheriff and Andrew, I've done a piece of stupid. We've all, we've all done stupid things. We've all done, done, done things. We all have had times where we knew better. Okay? And some worse than others, and some, you know, but even the best of us, who wants to be the, the best sinner? Who wants to be the best one walking in the darkness? We've all done, in a sense, but piece of stupid. We've all done dumb things. But when we walk in darkness, I hear God very clearly. I don't hear, hear him condemning me, but I do hear him reproving me. I do hear him, son, what are you doing? Sometimes. Sometimes I have to say, this is not my plan for you. I have better for you than this. This is not what I saved you for. I hear God very clearly. And God, and the fact that I'm hearing God, he didn't defellowship for me. Someone who deep fellowships shuts people out, cuts them off, turns their back. It's not going to reprove them. They're going to cut them off. God does not stop in fellowship, but if I live in sin, and if I do some really stupid things like adultery or, or uh, immorality and just a list of few things, I'm not just going to ruin my relationship of approaching God. I'm going to ruin my relationship with you. I'm going to ruin re 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 relationship with my wife. I'm going to ruin my relationship with you as a church, as a pastor. So if we walk in darkness, we will break our fellowship. Because we usually when we're living in sin, we're hiding from God. We're not running from God. And we will break our fellowship with one another. We're not as forgiving as God is. We're not as merciful. And there's consequences at times. We're usually on this level. Okay? Um, and there's, there's other consequences. Paul says in Galatians that if we, if we sow to the flesh of the flesh, not of God, but of the flesh, we will reap corruption. 
If we sow to the flesh, we will reap corruption. If you sow corn, guess what you're going to reap? Corn. Okay? And so, it, you know, it's not the carrot's fault that you reap corn if you sow corn. It's not God's fault. It's your fault. You sow the wrong seed. But, hopefully I make it this. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So, walking, and we don't walk in the light to impress God. We walk in the light because God has already cleansed us from all righteousness. We, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And as we walk right with God because God has made us right with him through the cross, we have not only have fellowship with God, but we have fellowship with one another. And hopefully this is making sense, because this opens the door for a lot of awesome things when, when we, we have fellowship. See, my fellow, when we live in sin, my fellowship with him is, 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 is challenged, and my fellowship with you is often broken. And see, it's not our issue with sin it's not, is, has to do with our loving God and our loving one another. If you think of the law and the prophets, all the law and the prophets hinge on loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and loving your neighbor and yourself. Most of the laws and the prophets, just using the Ten Commandments, for example, is adultery, stealing, killing, bear false witness. It has to do with my relationship with, with you. And so, when we... See, when we are born again, and we have His nature, and we are walking in the light... We're not going to do these things. Why? One, that's not who we are. Two, I don't, I don't want to sin against God. Three, I don't want to sin against you. That makes sense? And so when we know God, we have a relationship with God, we're not going to do that. But when we do, and if we do, sin hurts people. Sin hurts. No matter, there is not one sin that you can do that doesn't hurt other people. Whether it's directly or indirectly, sin hurts people. When you're not walking with God as you should, as you could, and growing and maturing, you are affecting the body. You're affecting one another. I'm not, this is not a blame game, but we affect one another. But when you're doing good, when you're growing, when you're, your relationship with God is vibrant and you're walking with God, you affect us in a good way. It's awesome. I love being around people who love God and are on fire with God and are walking with God and blossoming and growing. Praise God that by His grace we're saved. But I love it when people are, are walking from grace to grace, from faith to faith. They're, they're walking, they're growing in the faith and in the knowledge of God. They're growing and maturing. I don't necessarily like being around people who are grumbling and complaining about everything. People who are just trying to get away with things and, and messing up their lives and doing stupid things. And I love them, but I don't always love associating with people who are, who are just struggling like that and doing things. Does that make sense? But I love fellowship when it's wholesome, when it's pure, when it's good, and when it's lovely, when it's edifying. I love, you know, if you're struggling, I want to help you. If you're doing good, I want to hang out with you. Either way, I still want to hang out with you. I want to help you when you're struggling, and I want to rejoice with you when you're rejoicing. I want to mourn with those who mourn. I want to weep with those who weep. I want to rejoice with those who rejoice. I want to fellowship. I want to fellowship with you on your good day, and I want to fellowship with you when you need a hug, when you need a friend. I need that, too. I need the time where I, when I need some help, I can have fellowship. I need some help. I, and so that when I'm doing good, I want to share. This is what God's doing in my life. This is what God did. It's awesome. Let me just share it with you. That's awesome. We all need that. We all need to do that. We all need an environment where that can happen. But sin does damage uh, and destroy things. See, we need to understand the power and the importance of good fellowship. Hopefully I'm making sense. There's a lot I can expound on that. But when we walk in the light, we can have fellowship not only with God, but with one another. See, our fellowship is not based on what we do. Our fellowship is based on what He did. But at the same point in time, when we are sinning and walking in sin, we have a tendency 
to hide from God. God's not hiding from us. But we have, most people when they are dabbling in sin, they withdraw. They isolate. And, and, and so and they become like many times an island to themselves. I know there's different reasons for people to become an island to themselves and that is depression. Sometimes, I, and I, I'm not talking about we all need a break. We all need a time where we just need to, uh, you know, we just need to shut everything out. And we, we just need a sabbatical. And we just need to rest. I'm not talking about that. There, there's a purpose in that. There's an importance in that. There's a value in that. But I'm talking about we also need to have a regular diet of fellowship. That makes sense? Okay? Um, God did not just save us for fellowship with Him. God saved us for intimate fellowship with Him, so that we, by and through Him, may have fellowship with one another. I want to say that again. God didn't just save us just so we can have fellowship with Him. God saved us so we can be in intimate fellowship with Him, so that by Him and through Him, who's in us, can have fellowship. That makes sense? It's not just about this. This is crucial. This is the core. This is the center. But in him and through him we can have love and fellowship with one another. Jesus prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. That the world would know that, that he, God, sent Jesus. Jesus prayed that. That was, just before he goes to the cross, that was the prayer of Jesus. God didn't just save us so we can have fellowship with God, and that's all it is. No, that's and crucial. That's the foundation. That's the source. We're abiding in Him. But we're abiding in Him so we can, as a church, in a sense, abide with one another. That makes sense? As a branch, as a tree, as a, as a body. Okay? We're not, I'm not talking about codependency on one another. I'm talking about partnership. I'm talking about Fellowship. I'm talking about sharing the life with one another. I'm talking about a social intimacy that's healthy, that's good, that's godly, that's God ordained. Okay? Okay, uh, let's skip the head of my notes. Go with me real quick to Philemon. We were here last week. Okay, Philemon, uh, we'll, go, we'll start with verse 4. By name in is right before Hebrews. And I'm going to toggle uh, one more time back to the King James for this passage. By name in verse 4, and uh, Paul's writing here. It says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards all saints. You know, that conjunction is very powerful here in this verse, in a sense. Paul is not just praising, in a sense, these, these saints, or Philemon, he's writing to Philemon. He's not just praising him or admon, uh, 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 commending him for his love and faith toward Jesus. Yes, he is. But he's also, he's, he, 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 he is also blessed because he also has love and, and faith towards all the saints. Not just some, not just his favorite people, not just the people that he likes, <coughs> but he is, he, he's hearing of his faithfulness and his love towards God, towards Jesus, and towards all the saints. But then it goes on. That the communication of thy faith, what faith? The faith he just talked about. In verse 5. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by the brother. Now, I just got to get this off the back. 
when he's talking about bowels, he's not talking what we normally think scientifically uh, about bowels. He's talking about, uh, in just an old uh, English way of, or actually old uh, way of talking about the inner man, the inner feelings and emotions of man. I'm not here to refresh your bowels, okay? Uh, I'm not trying to be crude, but uh, anyway, uh, we're here to refresh you, though. But there is a refreshing when we have a love towards God and towards the saints. There's a, there, let, let me back, back, back up just a minute. We mentioned this last week that this word communication in here verse 6 is the word koinonia. That's big. Because that, that, that in one sense, that's, that uh, paints the perspective of what he's talking about. Because he's already talking about our love towards Jesus and towards one another. And when we have a partnership, when we have a, a social intimacy, when we're sharing and distributing life together <coughs> as the body of Christ, that the, the koinonia, the partnership of our faith, is a, it's not just my faith, it's not just your faith. <coughs> Am I making sense? It's not just my faith, but the koinonia of our faith becomes effectual when we acknowledge every good thing that's in us. When I acknowledge every good thing that's in me as the body of Christ, not only does my faith become effectual, but the, the saints are refreshed. Are you getting this? This is deep. See, okay, I'll make this sense. How do we fellowship at this level that God has ordained for the church to fellowship. There, I think we've already established the fact, and we're going to build it on this some more, that God wants us to fellowship. That God has ordained for the church to fellowship with one another. Are we on the same page? Because if not, i got to keep, I got to keep hashing that out. But how, and I believe, how many of you also agree with me, that our fellowship as a church, I'm not just talking about Lighthouse Discipleship Theater, but as a church, but also in this church, that our fellowship at, at, as a church should be at a deeper level than the fellowship of the, of the world at a bar, per se. That make sense? Should our fellowship be at a deeper level? Okay? How do we fellowship at this level? We fellowship at this level by the communication of our faith. Acknowledging every good work that's in us. Every relationship. You know, when, I, when we do marriage counseling, and we counsel marriages, one of the biggest things about any relationship is communication. Is that not true? So, we cannot have true koinonia if we are not communicating our love. No marriage is going to be good if we don't communicate our love. If we just, I told you yesterday I loved you. I told you when we, when we exchanged vows 20 years ago. No, we need to communicate daily. We need to communicate regularly. Does that make sense? And as we communicate that, I'm going to use King James language, the, our vows are refreshed. We are refreshed in our emotions. We are refreshed in our feelings. We are refreshed in our inner man. I mean, I, I, I'm probably going to put myself on the spot here. But if we're having one of those, Sherry and I, one of those, what we call intense negotiations, according from Star Wars, I can switch it real fast by just saying, I love you, honey. And whatever steam is coming, whatever... Uh, whatever things being exchanged, I can just switch gears. I hope I'm making sense with that. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to make fun of anything or, or whatnot. I'm not trying to even pay a picture. We have heated discussions all the time. But if we are having one of those intense negotiations, discussions, you know, I can melt her heart real quick. Because there are things I can go the other direction too, if I, if I, if I wanted to. But hope, I'm, I'm just trying to make a point. That when we communicate our love to one another, when we communicate 
that in partnership and koinonia, and we share that and we communicate that, our faith becomes effectual. As we acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Is that making sense? Okay? See, quite a again, is sharing your story, is sharing what God has done, is sharing what the miracles God is doing in your life. And when you do that, and when we do that as a church, that's what we do in our Bible studies and different things. When we do that, it allows our faith to become effectual. Okay? See, a healthy body, just naturally speaking, and I'm not necessarily the number one person who's into fitness, but a healthy body, I've been told that your cells begin to multiply. That's why uh, a few years ago, and even still now sometimes, uh, some churches will call their small groups cell groups. See, a healthy body, it, a healthy body, spiritually speaking, is getting the apostles' doctrine. And feeding on the Word of God. That's healthy. But somewhere we need to multiply. Somewhere those cells, spiritually speaking, need to multiply. We need to care about other people, not just ourselves. My wife is a caregiver. And they're taught if they don't take care of themselves, they can't, can't, they, they can't take care of their clients. So there, there's an importance, there's a, there's a supremacy, if you will, of taking care of ourselves. But it's not just about ourselves. We're taking care of ourselves so that we can care for you. And as a body, we need to care for ourselves so that we can care for one another. That makes sense? If we're not growing ourselves in the Word of God, I don't have anything to give you. But we can, as we grow... In our relationship with God, we can grow in our relationship with one another. And that church is healthy. That church is being the church. That make sense? We're not a church because of an organization. We're not a church because of a building. We are not a church because of a, a, a tax status. We are a church because we are the body of Christ, the family of God, we are individually saved, and it says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's not you and just me. We, plural, are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 1, since we have this ministry, we don't lose heart. It's we, it's the we in this. Okay? It's not just you, not just me. And we're trying to communicate this morning that we need the apostles' teaching, but we also need fellowship. And we need, we need to be systematically taught the Word of God. But we also need to have a regular diet of fellowship. Okay, at some level, that not only refreshes you, but also refreshes one another. That's key. You know, even on my car, I have a dashboard to see how not only the fuel is doing, but also to see how the battery life is doing, to see how the temperature is, and sometimes the oil level. But we have gauges to gauge how things are doing. And one of the gauges we can use about function is it refreshing you? And is it refreshing one another? I'm not saying that we are the source to one another. And I'm not saying you are my source. But God has ordained the body of Christ to be the body of Christ to refresh one another. Our main source is God. Our main source is the Word. But as God is in us, we will refresh one another just like coals on a barbecue. If I can put it that way. You get coals to get hot coals on the barbecue, they will unite. And we are better together than we are by ourselves. That makes sense? Okay? Again, I mentioned this a little bit last week, but there may be a season at times where you just need to receive and be ministered. Maybe you're going through something. 
Maybe something just traumatically happened. And sometimes you just need to come for a season and just a, a, a season and just be ministered to and get refreshed. But there needs to come a point where we must begin to fellowship at some level and at some place. That makes sense. If we're not getting any fellowship, see. In today's generation, we can get teaching through YouTube, through Google, through Bemo, and other medias, but we can't get fellowship out there. And so we need fellowship. Okay? Am I making sense with this? Let's switch gears a little bit here. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3. And we'll pick it up in verse 8. And I'm going to toggle over once more time back to the New King James. So Philippians chapter 3, we're going to pick it up here in verse 8. And Paul writes and says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says here in verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering to conform to his death. Okay? Paul talks about the fellowship of his suffering. And I have, I have, you know, this whole phrase, the fellowship of his suffering, can, can be confusing to a lot of people. I know me growing up, and even for years, I don't know if I fully understood this growing up, what it really meant by the fellowship of the sufferings. But let me just say this on just a kind of side note. Some people don't want to suffer anything. And then there's other people on the other side of this, they want to suffer everything. And religiously speaking. And we have both sides of the fence. And so, let me just say this. Christ, first of all, let me just lay this foundation. Christ has already suffered many things for us. He has already suffered the penalty of sin, which is death on the cross. And we have fellowship with him today because of the fellowship of his sufferings. We were crucified with Christ, we're buried with Christ, and we're resurrected with Christ. There's fellowship, there's partnership with that. Okay? Am I making sense? Just on that foundational level. But let me just say something and then let me explain myself. Christ is still suffering as our example today. He's not still suffering a physical death. He's not suffering sickness. He's not suffering poverty or limitations. But he is still suffering in this way. Christ is still suffering rejection. He is still suffering hatred. He is still suffering persecution. <coughs> and how is he suffering that? In us. Remember Paul uh, when he was still Saul going to Tarsus. Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Saul was persecuting the church. He was killing the church. He was monitoring the church. Thought he was doing the right thing. We know that those of us who know the story. But in essence, he wasn't just persecuting the church. He was persecuting Jesus. See, suffering bonds us in fellowship. Have you ever met, uh, for example, Vietnam or war veterans? They may never have met each other before. But when they know of each other, how they've been in certain wars, there's just a common there's a common, there's almost an instantaneous bonding 
because of the experience that they have felt. This could be even different people who maybe were at 9 11 and had the, twin, the, the towers or something that when people have been at a, at a certain event. Or sometimes there's an instant bonding because of the, the, the fellowship of the suffering. I'm trying to paint a picture here, so bear with me. We need to be involved with one another as lives of some of them. We need to be in a place where we weep with those who weep, we mourn with those who mourn, and we rejoice with those who rejoice. And that when we understand, begin to understand fellowship with God, we will also begin to understand fellowship with one another. And, in, and when we begin to bond, and we begin to fellowship at this level that I'm trying to paint a picture toward, I got another, another scripture we're going to go to in a minute that I think it will make it more clear. But when we begin to bond and fellowship at this level, as a body of Christ, something miraculous begins to happen. Go with me in another passage of scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want to tie this into what I just talked about here in Philippians. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll pick it up in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of our comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort from which we ourselves are comforted. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so are our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same, enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will be partakers of the consolation. Verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even in life. There's a lot here in this passage, so hopefully I can explain myself as I teach this, as we kind of wrap up this subject, subject on fellowship. In verses 3 and 4, Paul is talking about, excuse me, let's go back up. That God is a God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation. Jesus said that, and I believe it was in Luke 17, I might have the passage wrong, but Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. When we, when we were talking, when I did a series not too long ago on seeing Jesus in the, in the Revelation, I talked a lot about, in that last session, about, I was talking a little bit about the tribulation. And there will be tribulation in this world until Jesus comes. Okay. And there's going to be things that happen. But God is a good God of all comfort. And one thing I get in now, this, especially when I uh, read verse 4, God who com the, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort for which we ourselves are comforted by God. That's, that's profound if you, really, if you really read that. He's saying that, Paul said that we might be able to comfort those who are in trouble. God is a God of comfort who comforts us. So that we might be able to comfort anyone else who is in trouble. By the same comfort, we will comfort them. Do you see the coin in the end now? Do you see how God comforts us so that we can comfort you? God comforts us, church. He's the source. He's the God of all comfort. He comforts us so that we can comfort you. It's not just God comforts us and then we go live our lives. No, God comforts us so we can comfort you. Okay? 
Verse 5 says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. See, as His, Christ's sufferings abound. Our consolation abounds by Christ. Christ's sufferings, he still, if, if Christ is not still suffering in the sense of persecution that they have been talking about, it's abounding. But his suffering is abounding so our, our consolation can be abounding. If we really get that message, the verse, go, go on to verse 7. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will be partakers of the consolation. That, that, the fact that he's talking about partaking is partnership, which is koinonia, which is fellowship. We are fellowshipping with him in the suffering so that we can also be fellowshipping with him in the consolation. Verse 8. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to you in Asia, us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we were despaired even of life. We know from other accounts of Paul that he went through a lot of persecution. He went through a lot of trials. At times, like he talked about here in Asia, he was despaired even of life. But he was also comforted by the God of all comfort, so that he could comfort us, even by the fact of writing this letter, if nothing else. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of the, our, my trouble. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant of the trouble I've gone through. That was the spirit of your life. I don't want you to be ignorant that I was standing for the truth. See, Paul was standing for the truth in a dark culture. They tried to kill him many times. He was rejected. He was hated. He was persecuted. He says, but I, he says I'm fellowship with God. And he's comforting us so that we can comfort you. That's what Paul's saying. He says, I, want you, I don't want you to be ignorant of what we've gone through. But I also want you to know this, that we are fellowshipping God. And as we are fellowshipping with God, he is comforting us so that we can comfort you. And I, I, I pray that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you will get what Paul is trying to say here. I don't know if I'm conveying it well. But I pray that God will reveal to you everything you're going through has a redemptive value. Let me say this. Some of the things you're going through it's not from God, it's from the devil. It's not right, it's from the devil. But there is redemptive value in what you're going through. God can use what you're going through, through by the God of all comfort, by His grace, not because of what you're going through, but in spite of what you're going through, by His grace, by His comfort, as your fellowship with God, God can use what you're going through, even though it's not from God, it's from the devil, it's wrong, it's not right, but God can use it for your good to not only comfort you, but comfort the saints. That make sense? I am not what my own acknowledging that it's from God. But despite what you're going through, some of the things Paul went through, they were not God ordained. But God used them to comfort the saints. And Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. If you have fellowship with God, despite what you're going through, He will do comfort. He will, sometimes he will put you with some of us so that we can also comfort you and encourage you. That makes sense? Sometimes we need to be with some of you so you can comfort us. We're about edifying. He's given us a five-fold ministry that we can that we equip the saints for the work of the ministry that we can edify the body of Christ. We all need to be edified, not just from the apostles' teaching but from fellowship, partnership in this ministry. That makes sense? How many of you know we get beat up out there sometimes? And it's wrong, it's wrong to say, but sometimes in some churches we get beat up in the church. And that's wrong. This should be a safe place. 
This should be a place where we're comforting one another and encouraging one another. Is this making sense? Now, but let me just say this, and this is just a simple little thing that I've been thinking about the last few days. Sometimes we just all need a hug. I don't care who you are. I don't care how macho you think you are. I don't care what that. Maybe you didn't, hugging's not your thing. But we all need a hug. We all need to be loved. We all, God created us as relational beings. God created us that way. God created a baby to need affection. God created even animals, our cats, our, our dogs. They want attention. God created us to, to, to want that. If we want it, then other people around us need it too. And we need to be comforted, yes, primarily through the Word of God and through a relationship with God. But God is comforting us and ministering to us so we can minister to one another in fellowship. Since we have this ministry, it's not my ministry, it's our ministry. Am I making sense? Is this making any sense at all? Everything we do in this church is to help lead you to the apostles' teaching. At least, at least a, a, a pathway. We're not the only pathway. We're not, we don't got the only teaching. But everything we do in this church is trying to create an environment for you to be discipled in an apostles' teaching. We're trying to create an environment where we can be faithful and fellowshipping with one another. And we're going to look in the next few weeks that we also create a, a uh, an environment for the breaking of bread. We'll look at that up a little in a whole new level that we probably didn't thought of it before. And then also prayers. But I just want to close on this, and I don't want to make this, I don't want to close on a negative thing, but I just want to, as I was wrapping up these notes, uh, something just kind of reminded me. Yeah, I'll just kind of close with this. You know, in our world today, we're here in all kinds of school shootings and whatnot. And a lot of these things are centered around being bullied. Bullying. I was bullied in junior high, and I'm not going to necessarily rehash that story. It was some of the most horrific things I went through in my junior high years between the last, my, my latter part of sixth grade and through seventh or eighth grade. But you know, even as parents, and I'm putting anybody down, but we need to be involved in our kids' lives, our children's lives, even in their adolescence. And if we know they're going through stuff like that, I mean, we've heard, I've heard horror stories of even times where, in some cases, where the parents are just not so much involved. And, you know, no child, no human can be expected to overcome some of the horrors people have gone through and bullying if they don't have some source or some source of positive feedback, whether it be at home or whether it be at church even if they're going through something at school, but we need, or we all need to have some sort for a uh, comfort. That makes sense. If someone is they're getting, they feel like they're getting bullied at school, abused at home, and, and, and condemned at church. It's going to be hard for some kids and some people to overcome that. Hopefully I'm making a, big pain, a picture. I'm not trying to put pain a negative, negative, negative note. But the same thing happens in church. I've seen that sometimes, even sometimes even in our own thing that happened to us in the past. I'm not trying to focus on that. And that's not where I'm necessarily going with this. But I was just reading something recently, I heard something recently, and even Dwayne Sheriff mentioned this in his message about being a child being bullied and, and how, how can people, kids can overcome some of the stuff they go through if they don't have some positive influence from the parents or, or the church. If they don't have anything, how can they overcome this on their own? But I also know in some churches, and even in some grace churches out there, they teach grace, but they don't always demonstrate grace. And I'm not trying to put down anybody or anything. That's not where I'm at. But I am trying to just warn us in the sense that I've seen people bully people spiritually 
by in a sense condemning one another and in a sense bashing the Bible over their heads. I've seen people bully one another in the church by turning their back on one another and rejecting one another. I've seen people uh, turn, uh, bowling one another and refusing to fellowship with them, befriending them, and do gossip and slander. Paul talks about this in Galatians that we are to restore one another. He told, he told the church in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 that when the man was overturned unto Satan, but that he repented, we need to reaffirm our love to one another. He talks in Ephesians chapter 4, and it's actually the same context as some of our scriptures have been in the series early on, that we, we, when we backbite and devour one another, we grieve the Spirit of God. And again, I'm not trying to end on a negative note. <clears throat> and Andrew, in his own commentary, talks about in Matthew 18, that when we gossip and we defellowship one another, we are, in a sense, turning people over the same. And that, that's exactly how me, we're doing Matthew 18 in reverse how God has ordained the church to operate. We're supposed to operate in mercy and grace and love, comforting one another, admonishing one another, at times, yes, reproving one another in love. But the church should be a safe place. The church should be a place where we are encouraged and we befriend one another. We forgive one another. That makes sense? I can go on and on about this, and I don't want to make this a long topic, but it goes with fellowship that we, God, has ordained for us to be, continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, but he has ordained the church to fellowship and encourage and forgive one another. And if someone falls in a trespass, we who are spiritual are to restore one another. We are not in the business of turning our back and rejecting people. I understand that there can be, I'm not saying that we have to be buddy-buddy with everybody. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. But we are the body of Christ. We are the church of the living God. And we have been shown great mercy and we will show mercy and we will show grace to one another. We even have in our house a sign, mercy will reign in this house. If we're going to err, we're going to err on the sign of mercy. We're going to forgive one another. We are going to fellowship one another. Jesus hung out in, with the publicans and sinners. But he did not necessarily go all his way to hang out with those who condemned and judged and belittled one another. The, the prodigal's older brother, who wouldn't have anything to do with the prodigal would have anything to do with his brother, wouldn't even go fellowship with the father in his own house because of his brother was there. Not only rejected God, but rejected the father. The whole story of the prodigal son is a beautiful story of the prodigal, but it's more of a story of rebuking the older brother. Exactly what Jesus was doing. We're going to see this next week as we begin to the breaking of bread and covenant. The, the, the Jews had an issue the religious leaders had an issue with Jesus having a meal and fellowshipping with the scribes and the, the sinners. But Jesus was fellowshipping with the sinners and the publicans and sinners. I, I don't believe he was condoning their behaviors. I don't believe he was condoning uh, things that were going on. But he was standing at the door of the church in his worst condition and knocking. And I will come in and sup with you and you with me. Jesus didn't turn his back on anybody. But he was a little harsh with those who judge one another and condemn one another and refuse to associate with one another. This is making sense. I'm not, I don't want to end on a negative note. Church, we are here to edify. We are here to encourage one another. We get enough of that other junk out there. And some people get that in their homes, in their families, in their upbringing. We, we were talking to a lot of different people about relationship with God. And it's a hard concept with them having a relationship with God because they've had bad relationships in life growing up. With, their, with a parent, or with a spouse, or just in everything. That should not be. James says that, but it's how can we worship with God with the same lips and in the same room curse one another. Brothers, these things are not to be so. I'm not saying these things to, to, to hurt, to condemn, to, 
to uh, make a point, make a personal point. I'm because of something that we have experienced. I'm just making this is not the way the church operates. The church is a family. The church is the body of Christ, and we need to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Then we're going to look at next week in breaking the bread, which I know a lot to do with covenant with God, and then also covenant with one another. And that might be a foreign concept to some of you, but we're going to talk about that next week. Sorry, next week. Does it make any sense? And I, I, again, I don't want to end on a negative note. I want to end on a positive note. But as a pastor, I want to admonish us to take fellowship seriously. Again, we need to be well bound. It's not all about fellowship. It's also not all about the apostles' doctrine. That's the foundation. We need to do all four of these things in proper balance. We need to eat healthy. I told you before, I, I ate so many carrots as a child, I turned yellow. I believe carrots are healthy. I need to eat more carrots now. But I, don't, I, I, can't, I can't reconcile that turning yellow is healthy. I mean, I don't think I have any other side effects. But I just don't think yellow in that sense, uh, in that sense of yellow, is where I was supposed to be. Okay? Uh, I think we need to regulate. I think we need to have a healthy, balanced diet of everything. You know? And so anyway, I can go into all kinds of different things. Lord, we worship you. We exalt you. We magnify you. Lord, teach us as a church. Not just this church, but as a church at large. To learn again a fresh fellowship. Some of us have never been taught this. Some, this is a tough subject for some people. But Lord, I pray that you would teach us. Anyone who has ears to hear, I pray that we would hear what the Spirit is saying. That God has ordained the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. Lord, I pray that you would teach us afresh. That we can learn to be comforted by you. That we can comfort one another. And that we can also be those maybe we need to be comforted. Sometimes we just need to humble ourselves and say, you know what? I need a hug. I need some comfort. And I pray that this church would always be a safe church. Where people can, even in their times of their weakness and times of their failures, they can come and confess their faults one to another that they might be restore them gently and help us to do that in Jesus name Amen, Amen, God bless you have a great day, thank you for listening and we'll see you next week God bless you